Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Welcome to Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations. This evening we have with us two distinguished professors from Tufts University Medical School, Dr. Anna Soto and Dr. Carlos Sonnenschein. They're also professors in the Tufts Sackler School of Graduate Medi Biomedical uh, Sciences. They have been leaders in several areas of medical research, one of which is our topic tonight, endocrine disruptors. Their work in this area is internationally recognized and they've served on national and international advisory panels on endocrine uh, disruptors. Tonight, Dr. Soto and Sonnenschein discuss the health impact of BPA and other endocrine disruptors widely used in plastics, linings, in food cans, and many other everyday materials. They explain how these chemicals cause such a range of diseases and disorders, and they explain what policies are in place to deal with the problem and what the public must do to ensure protection. In addition, Dr. Soto and uh, Sonnenschein will talk about their very interesting related cancer research, which has led to revolutionary perspectives about cancer. It's a very great honor to welcome these distinguished scientists. Welcome. And may I begin, please, with asking, what does the endocrine system do? Well, the endocrine system, it's formed by many glands, the glands are little organs, and the cells in those organs produce hormones. Hormones are the mediators of the activity of the endocrine system. So we have the organs that produce the hormones, the endocrine system, and then all around in, in different parts of the body, there are the cells that respond to these hormones. So the function of the endocrine system is to coordinate uh, different functions in the organism. One of them is to maintain the constancy of the internal milieu, that is the concentration of ions, etc., in the internal fluids. Mm -hmm. That is the reason why we are not eating constantly. Our nutrients are always present in our serum, etc. The way in which they are utilized and released have to do with mm -hmm. hormones. Also, uh, they regulate uh, reproduction and growth of the organism. Mm. So there are many functions, and all of them have to be controlled according to the uh, changes in needs as the organism is changing activities. How do these, which you've called EDCs, uh, what is it that they do that interferes somehow with the endocrine system? That's right. Uh, the reason why endocrine disruptors have uh, taken so uh, important role in our understanding of what's going on in the environment is precisely because they modify all the normal functions mm. that w Anna described a minute ago regarding the uh, putting uh, uh, cells and organs in the right conditions to modify, if necessary, our responses. Now, endocrine disruptors precisely prevent some of these events because mm. they compete with, norm with normal hormones that are distributed all around and as a result of this interaction between the hormones or the uh, endocrine disruptors on the target cells that they uh, eventually modify is that the reason why the uh, different uh, symptoms or, or, or disruptions occur. And we have been in uh, 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 the forefront of discovering precisely what are they. 
and what are these impacts? Uh, like you had many examples, but we see papers constantly now about the, uh, it, it's such a diverse impact. Well, precisely the first one to be, uh, the first ones to be discovered are those that mimic the action of the female hormone estrogens. Mm -hmm. So uh, by doing that, they interfere with the development of the gland, the mammary gland, for example. Yeah. They will feminize males. Uh, they would um, alter reproduction, etc. So those are the first kind discovered, and actually the first one probably was DDT mm -hmm. that was discovered. It was given to roosters, and uh, it feminized roosters. So right there, to their surprise, because it's supposedly just an insecticide, right, right. Uh, it was found to feminize roosters. I think that was 1953. And uh, since then, things have changed. Now we have so many different chemicals, but the problem is that many of them uh, have been used in uh, just packaging, cosmetics, right. and uh, practically everything we are in contact with. And that includes Will like be, cans, everything. Yes, right. Like uh, soup cans, or etc. And uh, so we are exposed uh, to these chemicals through our food, our water, uh, etc. And our air, too. And yeah. like indoor air could contain many of these chemicals. Our contribution precisely has been that uh, early on we jumped, uh, uh, bumped into an accident in the laboratory that allowed us to uh, accidentally discover that certain chemicals, specifically a non infenol interfere with the effect of estrogens. And it was at, in 1989 uh, that we faced this uh, interesting problem in the laboratory whereby the experiment that we were running eventually ran uh, amok and we didn't know why until after a long uh, process of uh, 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 inquiry we discovered that this was precisely due to the fact that certain chemicals, specifically non infenol were shed from the, in, the centrifuge tubes that we were using in our research. And so it's kind of an accident, but you, but you as, a, as it turned out, it really gave you a big lead. Was this the test tube, the famous test yeah, tube this, <laughs> accident? That, uh, see, right. This is, we were in a way prepared because yes. we were studying the effects of uh, the ovarian hormone, estradiol, and in our assay, you would expect that only cells that have been exposed to estradiol, the female hormone, will proliferate. So we were expecting huge differences in cell numbers between the controls that didn't have the hormone and the ones that had the hormone. All of a sudden, everything, every well, every culture uh, had too many cells. And uh, we knew that the only the only chemical we knew that could do that was estrogen. So you were all prepared, but yes. it was still a surprise well, to yeah. find this in four the months, test tubes. <laughs> four months to figure out <laughs> where it was coming <laughs> right, from. Right. And then uh, one year to purify it from plastic. I mean, we, we had to extract innumerable uh, number of tubes. I mean, like hundreds of them in order to extract sufficient material. Uh, to determine the chemical na nature of it. Did I read that you actually had to inform the test tube manufacturer that you mm -hmm. learned about it before they learned about oh, yeah. it? Right. right. The, uh, so. This is precisely one of the characteristics of uh, these endocrine disruptors. Mm -hmm. People are not prevented from uh, manufacturing uh, right. uh, all kinds of uh, products without exactly knowing what is uh, involved in it. And when we call the manufacturer uh, of these tubes, first of all, they couldn't, let's say, believe it. And then they ac accepted the, uh, the, the uh, they didn't want to tell us what it was because of uh, proprietary uh, reasons. Mm. 
So they sent us several batches of these uh, uh, centrifuge tubes that were manufactured before and after uh. we had the accident. And uh, they could, they said, yes, we now understand why uh, this has happened, because the overt intention was to improve on the product. Right. Because these uh, centrifuge tubes were very fri friable, they, 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 they could break. Yeah very easily right. so they improved it yeah. and, and, they, <laughs> and in the process the of, of it, improving the they added this they didn't yes. change the catalog number they didn't uh, 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 change anything assuming that this was just a, a issue that did not uh, pertain to our knowledge the knowledge of the user exactly exactly so it was a kind of a multiple breakthrough there right. but it must have been important for other labs as well because nobody knew this you were doing a kind of unique research i right. suppose that mm -hmm. got it started but uh, that's quite a remarkable story that it's interesting because some other groups rediscover it yes later on right. and uh, so it affected uh, other people field. as well, uh, but yeah. if you are not working with estrogens, you won't notice. It, so you were able to yes. uh, beat everybody to it. But I wanted to ask you about this very broad impact on health, just uh, so many things, uh, uh, obesity and cancer, mm. which we're coming back to, uh, and uh, even things, uh, cognitive things, possibly autism mm -hmm. and stuff. Are you all convinced before we go on that it is that widespread? That if, if you see the animal studies, uh -huh. okay. you cannot uh, doubt okay. that those effects take place. The animals show, and, and now we are talking about exposures during yeah. development, right, fetal right, development, right. and clearly the animals become obese one of the most interesting things. Now I'm talking exclusively about bisphenol A, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that is also a plastic, uh -huh, mm -hmm. yeah, a plastic estrogen, and uh, it's clear that animals exposed developmentally uh, later on develop obesity, uh, alterations in behavior like anxiety mm -hmm. that people uh, have linked them with malattention syndromes, yes. if you will. Uh, behaviors, repetitive behaviors that uh, also researchers think are the uh, mice and rat equivalent of autism. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, decreased Deeper. reproduction. Yeah. The flippers. Yeah, the flippers. Uh, decreased reproduction, alterations in reproduction, uh, early cessation of cyclical activity of the ovary. It would be like getting early menopause. Yeah. Right. If that happens in women, that would mean. Uh, an increase of the risk of uh, heart disease early on. The latest uh, discovery was that it affects, BPA also affects uh, the uh, heart in females. And uh, then, of course, the work on cancer, that yeah. it in, in, uh, increases the propensity to prostate cancer, to develop prostate cancer and breast cancer. Yeah, it, it's uh, interesting you, you mentioned whether we were sure Mm -hmm. of this and precisely it's difficult to be sure we do experimental uh, biology precisely to see yes. whether there is a, 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 an issue with animals that can be extrapolated mm -hmm. to humans. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people say, oh, but you haven't proved it in humans. Of course, we would need volunteers to be exposed yes, to this. Yes, that's out of And the that is obviously <laughs> right. is an, an ethical right. problem mm -hmm. that uh, uh, have to be recognized. So right. what we do is to extrapolate in the closest possible way with what happened in animals to what may happen in humans. And eventually it happens in humans, as have been shown uh, uh, right. in uh, the European Union, with some research done uh, on that subject. Right. Yeah. Um, I want to, yes, I want, to, yes, I want to come back to this and, and on the again the cancer stuff that you've really been um, the leaders in. But I want to ask you before we go on is this that I want to get back to the generational thing. So you you've done a lot of work on the effects on the embryo, and you have 
shown that it affects, it's not limited to the generation at hand. Can you explain that for us? Okay, there are two things. Uh, <coughs> one is that the effects, I'm saying that because I'm, I'm showing a slide. Okay. Um, and the slide shows you uh, our history. We, we start being one cell, becomes two, four, etc. As you see uh, in the screen, there are no organs, nothing to discern mm -hmm, at the mm -hmm, beginning. Mm -hmm. So the whole process after uh, up to birth is becoming all this creation of organs. Right, right. And so if you expose uh, animals or humans during fetal development, the effect will be uh, irreversible because you will be affecting the formation yeah. of an organ and the function, therefore. Whereas if you expose humans mm -hmm. or animals at adult age where, you know, once those organs are formed, it's not that it would produce no effects, but a good deal of those effects will be reversible. Mm -hmm. So that is the huge difference uh, between have being exposed as a fetus and being exposed as an adult. Now, the other question is about early, very early mm -hmm. exposure mm -hmm. and how that uh, affects the uh, germ cells. Would you like to yeah. explain yeah. transgeneration? Uh, as the um, slide shows, we are talking about the fragile fetus mm -hmm. precisely because it is at that time when the organs are being formed mm -hmm. and as a result of this interaction between the endocrine disruptors and the formation of these organs, some uh, uh, malformations occur mm -hmm. and for the most part they uh, uh, take uh, effect in organs that are target for this estrogen, especially the estrogenic uh, uh, endocrine disruptors. So uh, uh, as a result what we see uh, when these animals, these uh, fetuses uh, are exposed and wait until they become adults, we see the effect that have been, let's say, uh, 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 kept uh, silence mm. until mm. the function shows up. Mm -hmm. As, for example, in the case of DES, the diethylstilvestrol, mm -hmm. the cancer of the vagina appears when uh, these women this, that were exposed during uh, uh, fetuses, pregnancy, yeah. they are uh, shown in puberty as having these cancers. Which would be very extraordinary to see a lot of cancer at that age, right? right? No, yeah, so, but it's just as that matures. Yeah. Yes, it was yeah. six ca cases reported at Mass General Hospital in 1971. So people were exposed, women, right, pregnant women right, were right. exposed between 48 right, and 71. It was stopped because the girls, just very young women, uh, got uh, clear cell carcinomas of the vagina. And that must have been really extraordinary. Uh, that seems so young. You don't think of yes. that kind of cancer, reproductive mm. uh, organ cancers, that young. Very mm. amazing. Yeah. That would appear in yeah. uh, non-exposed people at uh, 60 and more. Yes. And I it's say. not a very frequent cancer. But if we go back to the transgenerational, if yeah. you expose animals very early during the period of formation of the gonads, uh, so you see, before we become, uh, of course we have a chromosomal sex, right, but then right, right. Um, early on you cannot distinguish a female from right, a male. Right. There is a process whereby the gonad will become male or right, female. Right. When uh, animals or humans are exposed during that period, then you would affect a process that is going on on the gametes, that is uh, the right. cells. I, yes. yeah, that will form the next generation. I see. And that process is not, uh, it has nothing to do with genes in the sense that it doesn't alter the genes, but it's an epigenetic process. In other words, those, uh, the, the, uh, the genes mm -hmm. are marked indirectly at that time. Yeah. That is normal. It's marked right. uh, physiologically, but if a, an endocrine disruptor is present, the marks will happen somewhere else. And that has the propensity to be very stable. I mean, that type of marking. 
saw in animal studies that the animals were fo uh, followed up to the fourth generation, the, um, the malformations, the defects, the deficits could be observed in the first, second, third, and fourth generation. So it's quite stable, and that is why it's a cause of concern. Absolutely, because it could doom a whole species if it's affecting reproduction organs alone. Mm -hmm. Then, as we saw with like amphibians very early yeah. on, uh, that's very worrisome. And but. Another thing here is we're talking about trace amounts, aren't we? That is, that was mm -hmm. one of your points, I believe, that we're not talking about large amounts no. of no. this stuff, even very small amounts. Could you elaborate a little on yeah. that? The, the idea has been always, from a toxicological point mm -hmm. of view, that uh, almost anything that is administered in high concentrations will produce toxic toxic right. effects right. now with this uh, uh, advent of uh, endocrine disruptors we now know that there is a, a what is called an inverted uh, u curve whereby small uh, um, and high concentrations produce comparable effects very low concentrations are indeed producing many of these effects precisely because the sensitive of the sensitive nature of the cells that are affected by it. Now, the other sort of a, a corollary there is that uh, even if you could rid the environment, you know, stop producing mm -hmm. these things, somehow get them out of everything they're in, which is practically everything now, then even then. Well, first of all, can you get rid of them that easily? The second thing is you're still dealing with a generational impact, and nobody knows maybe where that's going to lead. Is that exactly? So you have the good news and the bad news. Okay. <laughs> the good news is uh, it's again an experiment carried out here in Massachusetts, uh -huh. Silent Spring Institute. So what they did is they provided volunteers with uh, food. So they had to eat canned food for a while, and so they measure bisphenol A in their urine. And then they give them clean, healthy, homemade food for a while. I think it was a few days. And you could see how significant the decrease of bisphenol A in urine was. Now, this is a case in which you can act because bisphenol A is more or less rapidly metabolized mm. Mm. if you find a way to remove it from the diet. Normally, we are exposed every day, so we right. always have a level. So with some chemicals, you can control it quite rapidly. Now, if a transgenerational effect already happened, there is not much you can do, but at least you can stop exposing people and producing some of those effects. For chemicals that have a very long half-life, it's a different story. Mm. Like, for example, PCBs have yes, a half-life right. of 30 years. Mm. That is that your level in blood will decrease to half of what you have at birth by the time you are 30. Mm. In that case, the effect won't be uh, seen that soon. Mm -hmm. In any case, I think, in both cases, I think it's worth a try. Oh, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, incidentally, the uh, uh, studies that were made by the CDC, this is the Center for Disease Control, indicate that 82% of uh, um, the population of the United States have high levels of uh, uh, endocrine disruptors, mm. specifically the uh, PCB, uh, B uh, BPA. Uh, this is, uh, I said 82, but 92 percent. So this gives you a magnitude of the problem. It really is a huge right. problem, yeah. And as a result, it is uh, difficult to find controls when people wish to uh, establish epidemiologically what is happening. In other words, you say, well, we'll take this population that has been exposed 
versus this population that has not been exposed. It, in fact, all of us are exactly. exposed. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's ubiquitous. It's all yes. around us. It's very hard. So you have an experiment where you give people healthy food, at least for a while, but there's mm -hmm. still, it's right. still out there. So it's very hard. I'd like to uh, delve into that a little more because you come up with clever ways at least to get into it. But while you're on that point, if it is rather urgent to take care of this. You are experienced with countries all over the world and their respective policies and the policy in the United States. It's my impression that the FDA has been really dragging its feet. So I would like to ask you about the policies for what are people doing around the world and the, the issue, you are right, uh, there are different ways to deal with the problem and uh, uh, for the most part the FDA is reluctant to uh, have not only the FDA, many uh, state offices mm. are, are reluctant to deal as should be done uh, in preventing the exposure of uh, especially children and mothers that are pregnant with these compounds. Uh, uh, this requires a political commitment mm -hmm. on the part mm -hmm. of the regulators. And usually the regulators are not very sensitive to those uh, requests for a number of reasons. Uh, there are countries where uh, our uh, um, plea to act has been listened more and there have been even uh, states here in the uh, United States that have been more sensitive than others. Mm. But it requires this type of political action that would put people, aw uh, make people aware that this is a serious problem. Yeah, are there countries where uh, you would, s that you consider have a good policy about this? They're trying to do something uh, uh, in terms of regulating? Uh, is there a big difference? Well, there is a difference. Like in the European Union, there is the uh, reach, and they are going to start testing chemicals, okay. among other things, for endocrine disruption. It's not ideal. Nothing is ideal, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. as you may imagine, uh, there are many interests in play. Um, but it's better than here. Uh, starting with the idea that they accept the precautionary principle and uh, using that they had removed phthalates mm. and um, which has been a very good idea. Uh, it's What is very remarkable is that most of the action occur because of public outcry and it was through the legislators not through the organisms <laughs> that are supposed to regulate. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the case of the equivalent of uh, FDA in Europe that mm -hmm. is called EFSA. I see. It's doing nothing, but uh, there is this regulation ah. uh, that comes from legislation. I mean, the, the, the uh, directive came because of legislative action in France, in Denmark, and in Germany. Okay. But but you have a public there in those countries that is well known for being well informed and assertive about policies they want to put through. Does that make a difference uh, uh, somehow? Yes. Probably. Uh, and also legislators that will hear yes. uh, people like us that uh, would uh, be interested in talking to people that, uh, that know science. I mean, there is a. There is a more science-friendly environment in the sun. In addition, because of, uh, let's say, the characteristic of the United States and uh, the European Union, there are a lot of legislators who are uh, MDs, medical doctors, yes. and they are more sensitive to what eventually may happen to their constituents. Right. So that is another factor that has uh, influenced a uh, more proactive uh, together with the uh, precautionary principle that has passed, which here is far from... Mm -hmm. Right. And you have the additional problem, perhaps, in the United States, where uh, each state can regulate things mm -hmm. off and on. So you have whole blocks of states that will be antagonistic. But the problem with something like this is that 
the stuff is throughout the environment. It's affecting everything and people are moving around and so on. So the fact that they won't regulate in state X means that it's going to affect a state that has a better conscience about it, for instance. Well, so yeah. it's a big problem, evidently. Unfortunately, for example, now there are states that are more aware that there is such a thing called global warming yes because of personal events that happen right. nearby right so uh, i hope that uh, the states will now be more uh, aware of the fact that this is not a free uh, thing that using uh, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, it, it hydrocarbons to to produce uh, uh, heat and things like right. that we have to renew our views in that regard. Right. If we could put a halt, if we could control things abruptly now, is it, have we reached like a tipping point with lies and like the, has come up with climate? You know that uh, in, uh, you reach a point where things are already accelerating so fast mm -hmm. that you have to come up with other kinds of solutions, not just stopping whatever this problem is. We think that there is a very serious problem here, mm -hmm. and I would say that we are already uh, taking uh, some we as mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. societies uh, trying to fix the problem that already exists. For example, for example, in Denmark, it's clear that there is a huge increase on reproductive uh, assisted reproduction. So when they did the study, uh, there they have single payer, and that is mm -hmm. the other mm -hmm. story. Mm -hmm. In Europe, they right. have single payer. Right. Uh, you can do universal yes, health care. Exa right. Exactly. So you can uh, go to the data set and see what's going on. Uh, and so therefore you can see those changes quite rapidly. And uh, they have found that it's about 6% of people that require assisted reproduction, a large increase. And people would say, well, but it wasn't available 30 years ago. Yeah. But they did something quite interesting that is to uh, look by age. Okay. So who's... Uh, who's looking for existing uh, reproduction, the youngest people, Very not interesting. the oldest people. Right. So there is a difference, and that was uh, first observed with a decrease on the quality of the sperm in, in Denmark my, yes, that was published in now. the early yes. 90s. So we have a serious problem there because if we do not reproduce, well, the species will be extinct. And uh, the problem seems to be there. Now, whether we are optimistic or not, I think that we have to act anyway. I don't think that is totally reversible and it's totally, uh, you know, uh, I don't think that we reach that point, but I don't know if we keep doing nothing, whether that will happen in 10 years. I have no idea. I right. know that it's a serious problem that requires action. Right. In the same vein of my previous comment, uh, Originally, it was thought that this was a Danish problem. The <laughs> fertility yeah. problem. Yes. Only the Danes. Yes. Uh, so then <laughs> the, the French uh, oh. <laughs> verified that that was a problem there. Now, in Israel, they have published just uh, this last week or two a paper in which uh, uh, there is a, a problem with the, the viability of uh, sperm in Israel. So. People will start reacting when uh, it touches them directly. Exactly. So, exactly. W in that sense, we are hopeful. I hope that it will not be too late. But this is the, the reality. People right. try not to see or not to hear because obviously these are bad news. Right. And nobody wants to listen to bad news. Right. I am very eager to look at your research. This okay. is, I, I don't know if people are aware that you had uh, a number of big breakthroughs and I don't think uh, that in the public we're very aware of what goes into research, how how long it takes, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the difficulties, especially of doing assays, and maybe you'll explain that a little bit. Regarding, regarding our 
own experience, which is the experience of pro probably a lot of researchers, is that you enter a field under the assumption that what uh, you are being told or w what you read is, uh, uh, let's say, reality. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you enter the field uh, with trying to expose other issues. Eventually, this sh shows, as in our case, that what we thought was uh, accepted is not. Specifically, as we started working in control of cell proliferation using estrogens as the, let's say, the lever that uh, would indicate how cells proliferate, we realized that what uh, the the textbooks say and what the publications in general say may not be the reality. It is true that you bump into problems when you start a new type of research. Uh -huh, uh -huh, and uh -huh. as uh, um, we published, for example, uh, the first cell line that was target for uh, estrogens. And as a result, we ask the questions using cells in culture. Mm -hmm. Now, perhaps uh, uh, Anna could uh, follow that. Uh, well, yeah, trend. I would say uh, when this started, the idea was that we know that if you take an animal, female, and uh, you remove the ovaries, the uterus uh, atrophies. Mm -hmm. sure. becomes smaller. So uh, you give estrogens and then it will become bigger. It contains more cells. Now, when you give estrogens, what you are doing is try to recapitulate what uh, uh, nature is doing in every mm -hmm. menstrual mm -hmm. cycle. Mm -hmm. That is making the uterus prepare for implantation. Okay, so one part of it is that more cells are being produced. And estrogens in the animal seem to do that, to mm -hmm. uh, make cells produce more cells. Mm -hmm. So we were under the impression that estrogens would stimulate the production of cells directly. And what we observed once the cell line was established was that those cells will proliferate maximally in the presence and in the absence of estrogens in culture. So that was totally different than mm -hmm. what you saw in the animal. Now, why, is, why was that? We put the cells back, because this is a culture, so you can inject them back mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. into the animal, and in the animal, they needed estrogens. Okay, so there was something, a mm -hmm. link, that was present in the animal, but wasn't present in the culture, and we decided that that could be, I mean, we decided, we speculated, that that was something like a hormone, something that would be contained in serum. So what we did is we now uh, put the cells in contact with medium containing serum, and they didn't proliferate, mm. and only proliferated when you put estrogens. So that was quite interesting because, and it could have ended there, because then we say, well, okay, estradiol is not stimulating but it's blocking the action of an yes. inhibitor, which is totally different. Mm -hmm. But then you think of it, and you realize that all these microbiologists that are working with animals that are unicellular have said always that you don't have to stimulate cell proliferation. <laughs> if you put bacteria anywhere, well, <laughs> as far as there are nutrients, they will it, proliferate. Exactly. So that is defined as the default state. That is, what do they do when they have nutrients? And when they do nu have nutrients, they proliferate. Mm -hmm. A famous Nobel laureate, um, uh, François Jacob, used to say the dream of a bacteria is to become two. <laughs> okay. So they do proliferate and proliferate, and nobody or nothing stimulates them. So now we reunite these two things because... What it showed to us is that the default state continues being the same yeah. in metazoa, but, I mean, multicellular organ yeah. organisms. Yeah. The difference being 
that the organism is regulating that by mm -hmm. putting inhibitors. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, we have a shape due to the fact precisely to this regulation by inhibitors. Now, there is another important argument, which is an evolutionary argument, that supposedly this, uh, the original cell that uh, is responsible for all of us Luca. being here, <laughs> Luca, yeah. Luca uh, uh, that cell didn't have around anyone who would tell it or stimulate it to proliferate. Mm -hmm. So that is a so-called epistemological argument <laughs> based on evolution that indicates that there is no need for cells to be stimulated. Proliferation will occur whenever you have these nutrients. And that original cell, in addition to uh, proliferate as a default, moved as a default. In other words, right. didn't have to be stimulated to move. It already had that intrinsic property within it. And as a result, due to evolutionary mechanisms, it, man it is maintained in multicellular mm -hmm. organisms like us. Mm -hmm. So when people say that in order to a cell to metastasize has to be stimulated to go places, cells move and proliferate just because there is that ability that they carry with them. I see. Mm -hmm. Right. So the only thing you can do to regulate proliferation is to stop it. Mm -hmm. That is one of the things that uh, was, let's say, a, a, a way to tell us that uh, you have to be careful with what textbooks say. Mm. And th so this this came out of your experience. Fortunately, you yes. were sort of prepared mentally for the right. discovery, but nevertheless, there was a kind of inherent contradiction to everything right. that you had it, it yes. was a in school. And, exactly, and exactly. And as Niels Bohr said, <laughs> yes. you always are looking to bump into a paradox yes, because that's right. behind a paradox there is an important thing. That's exactly, exactly right, and you find it all the time. So you're ready for that in right. your in there now in your work you set up a very important and I guess it is the it's the assay is that correct that everybody now uses and you're cited all the time for this and we don't know what e-screen is but are you able to explain it to us a little yes, bit that yes. we, we can understand uh, so the e-screen uh, remember we talk about the first estrogen from plastic yeah. monyl phenol that was discovered uh, in our laboratory, so we adopted this phenomenon, the yes. phenomenon of being hit by these unknown estrogens, uh, and develop it into an, uh, uh, a screen mm -hmm. to detect estrogens. Mm -hmm. So what we did was, now we have a negative control, cells, estrogen-sensitive cells, in the presence of serum do not proliferate. Okay, right. Negative control. Right. Positive control in the presence of serum plus estrogens, they proliferate about tenfold more okay. in our in our conditions. Okay, so you see six tenfold more cells. Fine. So now you take any chemical that you wish to test, and you add two medium that doesn't contain estrogen, and you look and see whether you get few cells or lots of cells. If you got lots of cells, this is an estrogen. And so using this method, mm. it's very simple. It can be done in culture. And um, most of the chemicals that were found to be estrogenic after nonilphenol were found to be estrogenic using the e-screen assay. Uh, actually, what happened is that um, right after we discovered nonilphenol, Theo Colborn organized the Windspread Conference that took place in 1991. And she invited me because one of the elements that uh, was missing there, I mean, she was interested in the uh, phenotype of animals in the Great Lake. The animals, uh, yes. the animals yeah. were feminized, yes. remember? Right. And uh, they right. have malformations. So, but if that was due to chemicals that were already banned, we yeah. just had to sit and right. wait. Right. So uh, she 
found out that Carlos and I had discovered nonylphenol, and that wasn't regulated. So that uh. that was like um, uh, a, a molecule that demonstrated that the problem wasn't a solved problem, that we had to look into this. And uh, when I was at Winspread, um, uh, Pete Myers, that was then the uh, president of W. Uh, Alton Jones, thought that that was a great assay and uh, gave us a grant, a very small grant, but uh, nonetheless with it, uh, we were able to uh, identify about 15, 20 compounds that were estrogenic among common things yeah. that are used in the environment, pesticides, uh, chemicals that are in plastic, etc. Now, you have to keep in mind that uh, at, at this point, I think that there are 150 compounds that have been characterized, uh, but there are 80,000 that are in current use that have not been tested. Mm -hmm. Oh, dear. Right. Oh, dear. Okay. Right. And then we're talking about things that pervade air, water, everything, right. all of your food and everything else. So right. you have a lot of work to do, no, don't no. you? <laughs> Before, as we're uh, moving into close down time here, I'm afraid, but I wonder if you could uh, tell us a bit about the cancer, uh, okay. the, 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 this just turn things around. I'm yeah. very eager to find out. Again how, how, wh what the status of yeah. it is now. Again, this uh, uh, episode that we are talking about occurred in the late 80s, early mm -hmm. 90s. At that time, we started thinking that it would be a good idea to uh, uh, put together whatever we have learned into a book, always thinking that, as the textbooks even today claim, that cancer was a problem of uh, cell proliferation. Mm -hmm. And in 1993, we started uh, writing the book under the impression that indeed cell proliferation was at the center of cancer. And we thought, now that we understand how cell proliferation occurs, we will understand what cancer is or mm -hmm. how it mm -hmm. evolves. And we, now in retrospect, can claim that we were wrong. The problem of cancer is not a problem of control of cell proliferation. The problem of cancer is a much more uh, complex issue that involves the interaction of tissues and not of individual cells. In other words, yes. the center is not a cell that goes haywire. Which is what we're taught. Right. Yes. All the and textbooks we will read. say this and right. whole and that institutions cancer is are a genetic working on event. it. It's <laughs> right. a genetic-based event. Yes. A cell-based exactly. event. Exactly. So we started uh, thinking and again we bump into evidence that indicated precisely that the problem is a problem of tissues that interact in the wrong way. I see. Do and actually see? I think that uh, in a way, we can say that the two things merge there. Yes, yes, the endocrine right, disruptors right. with uh, our work in yes, cancer. Right. Because there we realized that uh, cancer was a problem of organogenesis, of histogenesis, of the formation mm. of structures, shapes, organs, uh, where many cell types collaborate. So we say that cancer is development gone awry. So what we did is, we work with the mammary gland. So what we did is to separate what is called the support tissue or stroma. Yes. And the epithelium, that is the business part of the gland. Okay, so the business Produces part the that produces milk. Okay, so we separated the two tissues and exposed them separately to a carcinogen or the buffer in which the carcinogen mm -hmm. was dissolved. So now you have four combinations. Stroma, exposed, yeah. epithelium not exposed, epithelium exposed, stroma not exposed, both of them exposed, both of uh, uh, them non-exposed. Right. So you look at the four combinations, and what do you find? We found that if you expose the support tissue, the stroma, and not the epithelium, cancer arose. 
And that is totally contrary to the, okay. to the somatic mutation right. theory that is the theory of record, because in their case, the cell that gives name to the tumor, that is the epithelial cell, should be the one that mm -hmm. reacts to the carcinogen becoming a cancer cell. Our experiment showed that to the contrary, what is going on there is that you need the interaction of many cell mm -hmm. types mm -hmm to get to this uh, formation of a tumor. And we run the converse experiment, right? which is again the same thing. Now, you take a cancer and you separate the epithelial cells and uh, then you inject them in normal stroma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what you find is that a normal stroma will inhibit those cells, but not only to inhibit them from proliferating, it will push those cells to form normal structures. So you get normalization of what once was tissue, cancer tissue. And we are not the only ones that have shown that. Mm -hmm. I mean, right now there is about probably 30 references where people have done that with all kinds of tissues. So cancer can be reversed by normal environments. Right, which is something that the somatic mutation theory does not consider. It, yes. In other words, mutations are stable, and as a result, whatever happened, happened. And this is going to be the end of it, the story. While if uh, uh, you consider that cancer uh, is a reversible issue, you have to explain how come that this reversible uh, process occurs. So we have been able to uh, produce a tumor without exposing the cell that is going to characterize the tumor as a carcinoma. We exposed the stroma only and we got a, a carcinoma. I and see. when we got a carcinoma, we could normalize it by putting it in contact with a normal stroma. Now this is this is a sort of giant leap forward. <laughs> did yeah. you did you find resistance to this? I, it's so typical in the history of science, mm -hmm. isn't it, that you somebody finds the right answer to something and they're like, "No, it's not right." <laughs> that is, as you said, this is the norm. In uh -huh. other words, first of all, they say that uh, it cannot happen. Mm. Then they say, "Well, maybe," and. Finally, they say, we knew it all along. Yeah, of course, there so you are. <laughs> we, we are at this point almost to uh, the point in which uh, there are people who are starting to believe that there is something that uh, we yeah. have said. Uh, by the way, our book was published in 1998. So it has already, uh, let's say, over sure on the uh, camera too. a decade of being exposed and of course we kept on doing uh, research and publishing on the subject and we are invited to talk uh, yeah. to many fora uh, here in the states as well as in uh, uh, all over the world so we try to convince people that uh, this represents a real change not only from the point of view of uh, the theory itself that we call the right. Uh, uh, tissue organization field theory, but the pronostic of uh, cancer. I should say. In other words, we are being told every year that in the next 10 years there will be a solution to the problem. And year after year, these 10 years are going extended, forward, yeah. extended yes, right. in such a way that people are starting to believe that there is something wrong with the way right, we yes. look at cancer. We are proposing precisely to look at cancer in a different way that we uh, and others consider that is more realistic. Right. Well, I'm not an expert, but I consider the evidence you brought was very clear. At the same time, there was uh, Max Planck who said that you don't, <laughs> you don't convince people with data. <laughs> so you true. expect that eventually so they true. will die. <laughs> yeah. so true. New philosophers true. are listened to when the old philosophers die. Yeah. Yeah. This is exactly so, true. And uh, that, you and see, there, yes. there is a sociology of science. There really is. And that's your next book. 
perhaps that yes, I yeah. would like to, <laughs> because I had the opportunity to speak with the two of you very briefly about this, about uh, the philosophy of science, which yes. we're not given at all, so we don't have a sense, usually, of the history of the thing. What is your advice for citizens in this country that way? Well, I think that citizens have to understand the basics of science, mm. because otherwise they are going to be... Um, told things that are not true and they would have no way to decide. I think that Ernst Meyer, in the prologue oh, to his yes. book, uh, This is Biology, he said that he wrote that book precisely to educate people because you only can have a democracy if you have Educated citizens that are well right. informed. That's so we need to increase education in science. And I think that Carlos will expand on that, but I think that it's not only science. I think that we have to go a little bit back in time and think the way people were educated in the 50s, where people had to know history, philosophy, and all that, what is math. called a liberal <laughs> math, liberal education, oh, because you need to know history, you need to know... In uh, order to see yes, the picture. you have to see the big picture. And I think that education has to start very early in yes. that regard. But Carlos has more ideas. <laughs> well, of course... Uh, Science was invented by human beings, yes. mm -hmm. and it has a tradition of about 500 years, since the Renaissance. Mm -hmm. And uh, science is a social event, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, uh, people should recognize as well, in order to make them, let's say, come to scientists, that we are part of the society to which they belong. And unless you encourage them and you tell them uh, things as they are, things that we don't know, they, we will get more credibility because unfortunately, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, we are creating a group of uh, uh, people who have become the high priests of uh, even religion, mm -hmm. when in fact we don't have the right to do that. Mm -hmm. We believe that uh, scientists are part of this society. And they should be asked the same question that we asked bankers. Mm -mm. Unfortunately, we uh, <laughs> try to results. get them to talk to the people, right? right. <laughs> and uh, politicians, right? And uh, uh, mm -hmm. all the uh, people who claim that have the right to uh, clarify our ideas. Right. And scientists are not an exception. Right. So we need a dialogue, but a, a, an informed a dialogue. I do appreciate very much your coming in and talking with us. And um, it's been most interesting for me. Thank you so much. Thank you for, Thank you for having us.